Hello and welcome back to my channel, Deku Fanfic. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the movie part of our series, What If Deku Fought Monster of Chaos. If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Ham Baron from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. No POV. A man with black, brown hair and eyes is shown sitting in a cavern clutching his right arm. Even in the low lighting, one could see his arm twitching and straining just to open his hand. Hey, it's getting worse, isn't it? A voice called out. A woman was checking on him. She had red hair and heterochromia, her right eye being red and her left being black. The man sighed before saying, yeah it is hef. It gets worse each time I fight. Not sure how much longer I'll be able to move it. The woman rolled her eyes before saying, would you stop calling me hef? My name is Tana, Joanne. Or would you rather I call you Tyr? Joanne gives her a look before apologizing. The blade worked pretty well by the way. It helped with intercepting this latest trouble. Speaking of, how's it going with the kid? Tana sighed before admitting it wasn't going well. You should probably see for yourself. The woman guides him to a separate chamber where a group of people were working to restrain a massive beast. Serpent-like with eight heads and spouting elemental blasts from each. It kept smashing and throwing people away as they bound the creature down. He picked up a real dangerous one this time. Tana commented as the two looked on. Joe inside and said, I know, but the kid needed help and I would say he needs it now more than ever. The scene shifts to a bit earlier in the day. Joanne was walking through Mustafa and looking around, keeping the weapon Tana had made for him hidden beneath his coat. He pulled out his phone and called an ally. Frigga. Yeah, you sure this is the area? Would I be questioning Delphi? Maybe not, but she wasn't the one who had the vision. As he was arguing with the woman, he heard an explosion a few streets away. He hung up and ducked into an alley. Making sure no one could see him, Joanne leapt up to the top of a ten-story building to try and get a better view of the situation. But since the location was in a narrow street, he had to find a higher location, and leapt to the top of a 30-story building. He looked down and saw a mass of sludge and muck fighting a group of heroes. With one giant woman's ass in the way making it hard to see all of the details. Dumbass, your fat butt is in the way. But I can sense something. Where is it? Right as he was looking down there, Izuku Midoriya was charging in to try and save Katsuki Bakugo from the mass of sludge and slime he accidentally freed. He shakily smiled at Bakugo and said, You look like you needed saving. But just as he was freeing the bully, the sludge villain knocked him away. And when Bakugo struggled even more, something terrible happened. The sludge villain snapped his neck. Seeing the lifeless Bakugo infuriated the heroes, but for Izuku it was worse. He felt his sadness and despair grow to new heights and he could hear all of the things everyone had told him over the years. How they wished things could be different, that he couldn't do anything, he was useless, and that he needed to be realistic. Do you want power? The power to take revenge against this monster. To show others that they were wrong. Or do you assess something else? Izuku could hear this in his mind as the tears flowed and the mass of sludge stalked over to him. Izuku grit his teeth and his expression changed from one of despair to one of anger. If you can give me the power, then let me take it. To end this animal. Right as Izuku said that he felt something awaken around and within him. A flash of light engulfed the area, and in an instant, the sludge villain was reduced to nothing. Where Izuku once was, now there was the serpent-like beast with eight heads. Large and intimidating, lashing out and attacking everything around him even setting Mount Lady's head on fire and electrocuting her. All Might steps in as he only just arrived and is tries to stop the monster. But he is knocked away like it was nothing. A serpent roils up to attack All Might once more, this time with a breath attack. But the elemental beam is intercepted by a large sword dropping down from the top of the skyscraper. The serpent looks up and Joan drops down with a powerful drop kick to the center head. He then flips back to land on the hilt of his sword before leaping again punching full force with his titan right fist knocking the creature into the air. Leave this to me. Joanne demands before picking up his sword with his left hand and using it to cut and knock the beast away. Far away. This shocks All Might as he assumed he'd be one of the only people in the world who could do that. Emphasized when Joanne leapt away to follow the giant serpent. The creature lands on a beach and Joanne isn't too far behind. All right then, time to bind this beast, he says before rushing forward and punching ahead with his right arm, stopping it in place. He repeats this attack seven more times, while blocking the beam attacks from each of the heads, until the serpent can move no more. He sighs as his sword changes from a massive blade to a more manageable sized weapon, sheathing it on his left side. He tried to pull out his phone, but his right hand still couldn't move, so he used his left to call his allies. The first to arrive was a wiry built young man who sped up to the beach. Whistle quite the beast you restrained. Well I guess that fits. A tear. Joan gives him a look before saying, cram it Hermes. You don't honestly think you can carry this kid back. He doesn't have to. I've got that covered. Joan hears from atop the bestial Izuku's head. Sitting atop him is a girl with brown hair and eyes. She has a cheeky smirk while barely wearing anything to cover up her impressive bosom. But the most eye-catching feature is the large squirrel tail and ears she had. Joan has a flat look before saying, Rada. 
You volunteered for this. Since when do you do more than just spread gossip or scout? The girl pouts before saying, I can be more of a help than you think. I'll get this guy back to base. See ya. And with that, the girl teleports away with the monstrous Izuku. Right as she teleported away, some of the heroes arrived. Endeavor leading the charge with Ingenium and a few others behind him. They demanded answers on what happened and who they were. With the flame hero's power roiling. Well this didn't intimidate the two men, and they quickly dispatched the various heroes gathered. With Hermes making Ingenium look slow and like a fool to Johan walking through Endeavor's flames to punch him in the face and binding him in place. And then doing the same to Mount Lady and a few others that tried to attack. Who are you? Vernon asked while stuck in a somewhat compromising position after Joanne had bound her. The two looked back before one said, We are something that doesn't exist. Incarnates of something many deny being real. And with that, they disappear in a rush of wind. While the heroes were trying to figure out what happened, the warriors who warped Izuku away were doing what they can to restrain the rampaging Izuku. We're not getting anywhere like this. One shouted before being tossed around by one of the serpent heads. Joe inside before asking if Morpheus was at the base. Yep, right yawn here man, the warrior heard to the side. A heavy set man was walking up and yawning. This was Mikhail Sius, also known as Morpheus, due to him being the incarnate of said Deimos. You know, if I put the kid to sleep I can't keep the barrier around this place up, the man said with another yawn. Joan groans before saying, and if you don't do this, then the kid could rampage enough to collapse the entire cavern. So, with his point made, Joan gestured with both hands to stop Izuku from rampaging. Mikhail rolled his neck before clapping his hands. He summoned his Deuteros, a spectral entity that seemed to be a floating toga with a body under it made of stars. With a gesture, the being unleashed a mist that started making Izuku and the others who were trying to restrain him fall asleep. Well that wasn't exactly what I had in mind, but it works, the Deuteros user says with a shrug. Johan and Tana give him sideways looks before walking down to remove the other members. Once they were clear, they inspected the monstrous form Izuku was currently trapped in. Tana opened one of Izuku's eyes and could tell he was currently in a dreamlike state. Joan nodded before wondering how they could get into the boy's head to try and help him. Mikhail yawns and mentioned that he could do it. Just need to swap my Deuteros, the man says with a clap and the entity transforms into a formless mass that kept showing different shapes. He sent the his Deuteros toward Izuku to try and interrupt the boy's dreams and help break him free, only to be rebuffed by the serpent creature's mind. What the? Mikhail said while recoiling a bit. Joan hummed before looking over the creature before him, noticing a pattern on the strange body of the transformed boy. I think it's Yamada no Urachi itself rebuffing you. It still wants to rage and rampage, so it's pushing you back. Great. That means I can't do it alone. I need some extra muscle, a power amplifier, and another to possibly jump into the kid's dreams. The sleep and illusion incarnate said. Joe sighs before saying he'll act as the muscle. I'm a war god after all. Psyche and Eros are here right. Tana nods and goes to get them. Once the husband-wife duo arrived, they were ready to help. Tana gave us the basics. You want me to use my abilities to help amplify Morpheus right? The feminine-looking man named Pico Sara said. He was the incarnate of Psyche. His wife was a larger woman with a buff build named Callista Papatanis and was the incarnate of Eros. She held her husband's hand as they looked over Izuku's monstrous form. Don't worry, he's out for now. But we need some way to get into his head to break him free from his nightmares and whatever else is holding him in place. Johan says while looking down at his hand again. This is when Rada or Leaky Hapala popped in and offered to help with getting in Izuku's head. Teleporting is my specialty after all. Mikhail sighs but they agree and each member powers up. Joan tightens his fist and keeps it set on Izuku's serpentine body. So he stayed bound in place. Mikhail summoned not one but three Deuteros. The first two were the incarnations of Morpheus Phantasos and Iclos was the last. Pico summons his own Deuteros that acts to amplify Mikhail's mental and dream powers. Leaky narrows her eyes and waits for the moment to jump in and get inside of Izuku's head. Teleporting forward when Mikhail announces her chance. The girl suddenly finds herself floating in a space that appears to be just black space. At least until she sees Izuku in the distance. Hang on kid oh shit. Leaky says when multiple snake heads swarmed around her and tried to push her away. The squirrel-like girl dodged around as fast as possible. Teleporting and climbing on the creature's form. But she was eventually knocked flat and about to be swarmed by the heads of the monster. Only to be saved at the last second by a facsimile of Tyr, Psyche, and all three of Mikhail's Deuteros. Get moving. One shouts while holding the creatures in place. Leaky nodded and warped as fast as she could to get to Izuku. And when she arrived, Izuku wasn't in his teenage state. The Izuku before her was just a child. No older than four years of age. He was crying and curled up in a chair. An All Might figure clutched in his hand. Leaky reached out for the boy and then she noticed a few other things. The first was a computer screen off to the side. But what was on the screen told the girl all she needed to know. She saw images of Izuku being told about his quirklessness, of pleading to his mother about wanting to be a hero and her just crying and saying she wished things could be different. 
the abuse he endured at the hands of Bakugo and many others for his dreams and lack of power, and the last straw being what All Might said to him about being realistic and then being unable to save someone just because he didn't have power. The older girl was crying at seeing this and embraced Izuku. I'm sorry for what you've had to endure, but you can't let this control you, and you can't let this monster control you. He'll just use you to hurt so many others, she pleads to the young boy, who then looks up at the squirrel girl with tears in his eyes. He tried to ask if there was any worth in him coming back or trying to fight back against this creature. Leaky was about to tell him there was, when one of the snakes broke free and attacked her. Izuku saw this but couldn't muster up any initial courage to fight it, especially as the memories flood him once more and make him feel almost paralyzed with fear and self-loathing. But just when the daemon thinks it has Izuku trapped again, the boy's body starts moving on its own. He rushed toward Leaky and tackles her out of the way of the monstrous head of the beast. The Yamada head reels back and prepares to strike again, but Izuku keeps Leaky covered with his body. It stops short or rather is stopped short by a different head that broke free. That is when Izuku puts it together. Now I get it. If I don't exist, then you can't. That's why you trapped me here with my worst memories. So that way, you can keep using my body to rampage and destroy. Izuku says while standing up. His knees are still shaking, but he manages to steal his courage enough to square off with his daemon. One of the heads lashes out, despite the lead head's warning and Izuku catches it with his hands, or rather with the imagined hands that look similar to All Might's. This is my body, and I guess you are my power now. Even if you want to rampage, I won't let you. Izuku roars before pulling the head towards himself. It seemingly rips from the body of the main Orochi and then fuses to Izuku's body in the mind. When another head tries to attack, Izuku lashes out with the mental All Might hands again, or he would have done that, but the head he absorbed also came out and bit into the neck of the other head. This surprised the boy, but he had an idea on what to do next. With a roar of exertion, he pulled the next head back and it was again ripped from the main body, and then added to Izuku. I think he's figured something out. Let's help him. The tear image says while keeping a tight grip on the main head. One of the other images releases its head and Izuku takes it back once more. He does this one more time before the Yamada no Orochi breaks from the others and tries to attack Izuku. A four-on-four -four match is what it thinks, as it had four of the heads. As did Izuku. But he wasn't fighting alone. Leiki teleported around and kept the heads distracted while Izuku lashed out with his Arachi heads and pulled them off to be reabsorbed. Until it was just down to the fire head alone. No, you can't. I am the Yamada no Arachi. I destroy and consume all in my path. It shouted before Izuku took hold of it as well. That was true at one point, but I won't let you control or consume me. Nor will I let my memories hold me down anymore. Izuku says before ripping the final head away and absorbing it once more. Once done, all that was left were the wriggling tails of the creature. Izuku collapsed after pulling back the heads into himself, with Leiki catching him and telling him he did great. She was then pulled out of his mind by the other incarnates as they let up their own powers. Back in the main world, Izuku's monstrous form was dissipating, and Mikhail collapsed from maintaining three daemon and Duteros at once. Glad that's over. Man, this kid had a lot of messes in that head of his, the man exclaimed with a groan. Joan was breathing heavy as well from maintaining the Glepnir bonds to make sure Izuku wouldn't thrash around. Pico was caught by his wife and Leaky ran over to help Izuku as he was turned back into a human, and falling due to the size difference between the two forms. His green hair was a bit matted and he was sweating, but it was enough to tell the girl that he was okay. Great job, kid. You fought against all of the demons and won, she said while hugging Izuku close. Hey, you might want to ease up a bit. You're kind of giving him a marshmallow hell with where you've got him. Joan say with a raised eyebrow. Leaky looked down and saw it was true and let Izuku out of her boobs. Tana came in then and helped each of them up as well as some of the other minor incarnates. Tana noticed that Johan's hand still wasn't moving and put her own on it. You were willing to possibly give up your hand to help the boy. Something like that, yeah. Though this is only his first step. Now he needs to know more about the world he's become a part of. Johan says while standing up. Izuku is taken away by some of the incarnates that had healing capabilities to be treated. With Leaky keeping an eye on the boy. Tana then notices something laying on the ground where the massive beast once writhed and rampaged. She hums before saying, I think I can make the kid something good with this, and he'll be an even more capable incarnate if he chooses to learn more. No POV. Izuku shook his head after waking up in the cavern after beating back his daemon. Ooh, I feel like I got hit by a truck. Izuku thinks aloud. You basically were, Mikhail said with a yawn. Izuku looked over and saw the man before asking who he was. I am Sua's kid, but a lot of the folks here call me Morpheus, though frankly that isn't my only daemon. Izuku looked at the man oddly before asking what he was talking about. Mikhail hummed before asking what Izuku remembered. Um, I remember. Kaken, is he? Izuku started before noticing the look on the man's face. It almost started Izuku on a spiral once more, but the older incarnate pulled him out by telling the kid to focus. Sorry, it's just... Anyway, I remember him. Dying and then I heard a voice in my head. Mikhail nodded before saying, Yeah, that was your daemon. Yamada no Orochi. At least that's what Joanne or Tyr suspected. Before Izuku could ask about that, Morpheus nodded for him to continue on what he remembered. There was, I thought there was someone who helped me, or talked to me when I was stuck in my nightmare. 
This is when Lakey pops in and tells Izuku it was her who jumped into his dreams. Wasn't really sure I could do that but I'm not complaining. The slightly older girl says with a bounce, and her chest bounces with her drawing Izuku's eyes. He shakes his head before asking what was going on once again. It's a little complicated kid. Joanne could give you a more succinct explanation. We'll take you to him, Mikhail said while standing, offering the kid a hand up. Izuku took it but was a bit uneasy as he was walking through the network of caverns. Where are we? What is this place? He asked while looking back and forth through the tunnels, seeing some very strange sights. Some seemed to have large amounts of greenery when there should be none. Others seemed volcanic or similar, and one almost looked like it should be underwater. Like I said, Joanne can explain more later. He's meeting with Hephaestus to get something made I guess, Morpheus said while walking further ahead. Izuku jogged a bit to catch up and was soon greeted by another volcanic room. Or it seemed that way. It was actually Tana's workshop area and forge, where she was currently making some equipment for various uses, the lead of which being for Johan. That should do it. Here, put this on, she said to the man who still had his right hand tightened into a fist. She helped him attach a gauntlet-like piece to his right and showed him how some of it worked. Okay, this should help you to maintain some measure of function, even if by proxy. Not to mention, it'll give you more options for a fight. Tana says before suggesting a few ways to move the gauntlet. Joanne uses a punch, and a line of ribbon appears out of the end of the bear-like mouth. He then takes a defensive stance and a barrier forms in front of him. And finally, the bear head reformates into a hand that can pick up items or use a phone. Well at least that takes care of my main problem, Joanne says before thanking Tana. She smiles before addressing the company they now had. Izuku though started remembering some of the details when he was out. Is that because of? Don't go there kid. I ended up like this because of my own choices. It's not your fault. Joanne cuts Izuku off. He acknowledged that it was an inevitable matter as well. I am tear after all. This was bound to happen sooner or later. Izuku is confused by that so he goes back to asking what was going on. Didn't feel like telling him and he's asleep. Great, the warrior started before realizing Morpheus was asleep once more. So he sighed and told Izuku to come with him. Lakey said she'd take Mikhail back to his room so he'd be sleeping safer. See you later Izuku. I hope you're ready for what comes next. She said before teleporting away. But the boy was confused and had even more questions about what was going on. Joe inside before waving to the boy to follow him. They walk until they are outside of the cavern base of their group. So short answer, we're unusual types of people. Even for this quirked world. The abilities you've seen, they aren't quirks. It's the abilities of we incarnates. Joan explained that he, along with Izuku and most of the others, were special beings that could tap into something unforeseen. The collective unconscious. And from there they would gain powers from entities known as daemon. It varies from entity to entity, but most gain a basic strength, durability, speed, and cognition boost. Though many of the ones here are, while they aren't really strong incarnates, kind of a side effect of many of them being of the ten million gods lineage. Doesn't that mean they're all Japanese, or tapped into Shinto gods? Izuku questioned with a slightly incredulous look. Joan chuckled at that and acknowledged it is true. He then went over some of the other details pertaining to incarnates and how their powers worked. Illustrated by Tana setting her hair and hands alight with forming a hammer of fire in her right hand. She, you, and me are known as transform types. We're one of the more common types of incarnates. Just as the name suggests, we transform into our daemons. To a point at least. Izuku hums and asks how Joanne's worked. And the man demonstrated by growing about two feet and gaining bear-like armor. I'm not really a fan of that size shift, so I prefer to fight like this, the man explains as he shifts back to normal. He then goes over the Juteros and that they were doppelganger entities that would fight alongside an incarnate. Or in the case of Morpheus, he uses his various dream Deutero to create a barrier around this place to keep us safe. Tana explained while letting off her fire. The last type or summons, at least that's the best example I can give. They can summon entities related to the daemon in question. If associated with a death god, they could summon zombies or spirits. Some elemental types can create creatures from an element, like snowmen or stone golems. He noted that summon types were the rarest and often dangerous. I think we only have one of them here. She can make entities from water so it's safer in general. Joan explained with a shrug. This is cool and all, but it still doesn't explain all of why I'm here. Or why we had to come out of. A mountain. I guess that makes sense but still. What are you hoping to do? Izuku asked with some fear and trepidation. Joan sighs before saying, I'm going to try and help you get a better handle on this new power you have. The power from Yamada no Orochi. Izuku is wide-eyed at hearing this in gulps. He then hears the whispers of the monster in his head. Izuku shivers before both of the older incarnates get his focus back on the here and now. Izzy, look, we'll help you in understanding your new abilities. But you need to focus on the moment. Tana says with a look to the boy. Okay, where do we? Wait, my mom. I don't. She doesn't know where I am. Izuku says before pacing slightly. Joanne has an odd moment before looking to Tana. She sighs before offering a specially made phone. This should let you call home. And it'll keep our location secret for now. Izuku looks at her funny before calling home. To a mother who was panicking and then asking specific questions. Ones that seem to be either forgetting answers or. Is there someone there running a trace? Izuku asks with some confusion. 
Yes, Izuku, you've been gone a few days now. They said you were turned into some kind of monster and these strange people took you away. Please, honey, I need to know where you are. Izuku gives the older incarnates a look before saying he didn't even know himself, and that they were trying to help him figure out what he could do now. That monster, they said they can help me get control of it. Honey, if you have a quirk now there are better teachers than a group of kidnappers and possible villains. Johan and Tana raised their eyebrows at that and asked if they could speak with her and the police heroes that were listening in. One of the heroes obliged, that being the flame hero endeavor. I'm curious on what these villains think they can use as a defense. Johan's eye twitches before sighing and speaking first. Maybe you should deal with your own issues at home before worrying about someone else's. Just because you uphold justice doesn't mean a lawbringer like me can't put you in your place. Eyes on the hero side were wide at that set of statements. Endeavors the widest as his flames eased off and his face was shown. Johan and Tana then explained that they know more about what Izuku was because they've been through similar changes as well, and could help him with adapting to all of it. How do I know I could even trust you to look after my son? And Ko exclaims with tears in her eyes. But what Johan says next shocks her and the rest. I didn't give up my right hand to save this kid for nothing. I believe he can do so much more than anyone with a quirk. It's true mom, Joan San's right hand. He used it to keep me from thrashing in my monster form. And within my mind I think, he helped to reign in what turned me into that thing. And it cost him permanent use of his right hand. The heroes were wide-eyed at hearing this as they assumed the worst when it came to Johan and the rest. Given how they humiliated all those who went after the Arachi form of Izuku. And now they hear that this stranger had given up a limb to save some boy he knew barely anything about. Who are you? Vernon asked with some unease. On the other side, Tana and Johan shared a look before Tana asked to see her phone again. She put in a set of codes before forcing something no one believed possible to the other side. A video screen image showing Izuku first, making Inko cry at seeing her son looking safe. And that is when Johan and Tana are shown, this time with a state that surprises the heroes looking on. Tana sets her body ablaze and summons her hammer, while Johan transforms into his tear form. As Hermes said the other day, we are incarnates of something you wouldn't believe exist, and we watch out for our own. Tana says before cutting off the communication. Izuku gives his mentors a look of panic and worry before asking if they were going to fight the heroes. Johan just shrugs before admitting they'd only do it if it was necessary. But that isn't the important part. Right now, helping you figure out your transformation is. Izuku gulps before nodding and taking a scared stance. But Tana stops him and tells the boy that wasn't where they would start. You have to connect with your daemon once more, and be able to handle the power. So, connect with Yamada no Orochi and see what you can do with it. Izuku panics and questions what would happen if he lost control. Yeah, that's why I'm here. I can keep that beast in check. If Tyr could help bind a monster that would destroy the world, I think I can handle a rampaging snake. Joanne says with a smirk. This helps ease Izuku's worries but he still isn't sure on what to do. Asking the pair how this exactly worked. But all they could tell him was that he had to figure it out for himself. So he thought about it and tried to reach deep for the connection to the monster. Eventually, he found it. Deep within his own mind and sealed behind some sort of cage. Did they do this? Or did I? Izuku thought while looking around his mind. Oh you did this alright. You managed to push me back. With a bit of help, Orochi said with a hissing flick of its tongue. Izuku hummed before asking what Orochi was really after. If all you want is to destroy, then I don't think this will work out at all. The lead head roared a bit before asking why he shouldn't rage and rampage. You felt immense pain and anger for years. All because you were different from the rest. Maybe, but some of those who are different are ones like my parents. Which is all the more reason to not destroy everything. Izuku says while trying to stay firm. The two go back and forth on trying to convince the other to follow each other. But Izuku's own thoughts manage to get some of the other heads thinking about different matters, to the point that they start to agree with him, while the fire head works to keep control and stay in charge. To no avail. You can't be serious. I am Yamada no Orochi. I do not aid humanity. I consume all before me. Izuku glared before saying his own piece, even as he was trembling. You used to, but now you're connected to me. And if you're going to exist, then I need to direct it in a way that could help others. Or more importantly, save others. So, you can get on board with that. Or you can just rot in here. The other heads agree with Izuku and remind the main head how he defeated them originally. Besides, he is our incarnate and thus our only link. Why not go along and see what could happen? If he's going to be a hero, the fights we get into could lead to plenty of destruction as is, the earth head hissed to the fire head, who finally relented and snarled at Izuku as he said he'd follow the boy's lead. But don't assume this will always be boy. My nature is too volatile to stay put. Izuku let out a breath to hide how scared he was and agreed. Now, let's see what we can do. Only a few minutes had passed in the real world as Izuku was facing his demon, and he finally felt what he could do fall into place. He gripped his fist tight and a set of serpents formed on either side of his body. Fire, earth, poison, and light on his right side. While lightning, water, wind, and darkness on his left. Interesting. So what can you do with it? Johan said while focusing more energy into his blade while facing down with the boy. Izuku looked between the serpents, his hands, and the older warrior before saying, I'm not entirely sure, but we'll find out. He threw some punches at the man, and they began sparring. 
Over the next few months, Izuku would train and learn more about incarnates, their abilities, and how they differed from those who had quirks. So any idea where quirks originated? After all, one could say that we are supposed to be a next step as well and we're older. No idea, man. It's always been a mystery, Mikhail said while relaxing one day, a day he was spending with his family. Lakey saw at one point that Izuku was feeling a bit homesick. So, she took it upon herself to bring his parents to their hidden home. She smiled while saying, figured this was one of the best ways to help you feel better. Plus, it might put your parents at ease. And while they were disoriented, both elder Midoriyas were happy to see their son. After getting a bit more of an explanation, they were curious about the world their son had been dropped into, especially with how chummy Lakey acted with him. She brushed this off by saying she felt more like a big sister to Izuku. I didn't have siblings growing up. So this is kind of nice, she said during one of their first visits. And like a sister she was, though he did find her a bit overbearing at times. But something else often felt off with her. She reminds me of, well me, before I came here. He thought this a few times before but the girl would never answer when he brought it up. Often deflecting and trying to show him more about how to use his abilities. Even how to use any of the heads to fire elemental blasts. But he was determined to get an answer sometime. I still can't believe all of this. Abilities that have nothing to do with quirks, a conclave of them hidden from the world. I wonder how many. Incarnates are out there. The Sashi said while enjoying the forest lake they were relaxing at. Tana spoke next by mentioning that there were probably more than they knew. But some like us prefer to keep to the shadows or out of the spotlight. Others, well let's say they may be working with various dangerous groups to do more damage or change the perception of the world. And Ko and Aseshi nodded before wondering what about some of the other members of the conclave. With Izuku showing off something he'd only recently figured out how to do. Turning into his full incarnate form. A giant snake with nine heads compared to the usual eight. Well, it shouldn't be too much longer. He's in control and probably won't rampage out of control again. It may be time for him to return home. Joanne noted while holding some tongs in his pseudo hand. Grilling a bit of meat and wild vegetables, the hunting and nature incarnates had gathered. Izuku returned to his normal form before asking if Joanne would be going back with him. I mean, I want to go and show the good that can come with us incarnates. But all of you live out here. That doesn't seem right. Tana shook her head while adjusting the heat of the flames. No, it's probably for the best that we stay away from others. A few of us here have. Not the best memories involved with most that have quirks. And that's not counting those who have issues with those who were animal-like incarnates. Lakey knows that well. The squirrel-like girl freezes up at this before curling into a ball. Izuku was a bit confused and checks on her, and then notices a large scar on her back near her tail, when she often kept covered with said tail or with other clothes. Did they? Izuku trailed off before the older girl nodded. It's a little funny you know. While the cities might be more accepting, there are plenty who force others out. Just because all of my family didn't have quirks, most of the ones in the boondock town didn't pay us any mind. But when I became an incarnate, it changed. She noted how all the ones who attacked her were those with emitter or transform quirks, disliking the fact she was turned into a partial animal, calling her tainted or cursed. Haiti and Issa died trying to keep me safe. I was only saved when Joanne showed up and gave them a bit of retribution. The man mentioned that he didn't kill anyone, but his abilities as an incarnate of justice allowed him to turn any luck the people had on them. Within a year, most of them lost everything. They were trapped in the same kinds of hell they put her through, he said with a firm glare at the grill. And Ko had tears in her eyes at hearing this and ran to the girl to give her a hug. Isashi himself coming over to comfort the girl as well, though more subdued. Izuku meanwhile gripped his fist before exclaiming that was all the more reason to go. I didn't know about a lot of those things, but we could make a difference. Not just because we're incarnates or just for us. Think about how many others might have gone through exactly what you did. All because of their quirks and not a daemon. They wouldn't have had anyone who could really save them until it was too late. Izuku said this while extending a hand to Lakey, asking her to come with him back to Mustafa. I know you all want to stay hidden, but my dream has always been to become a hero, alongside Kakan, but he's gone now, so I have to carry that dream, my own, and maybe become something of a symbol like All Might. Lakey looked up at the boy with some unease but she could feel a measure of hope in his words and what he could do. So, she gingerly reached out and took Izuku's hand. Tana had a little tear in her eye at seeing this, while Joan was pretending to be stoic. Inside though, he was crying and hoping it would help her. Well then, guess we're losing our best getaway. But it is probably for the best. Don't worry, kid. I'll pick up the slack. Hermes or Herman Nephis said with a smile. So plans were made for Izuku and Lakey to return with Hisashi and Inko. With the various incarnates giving blessings or gifts to the two young incarnates and the elder Midorias. Izuku wait. Before you go, take these. Tana said while handing something she'd been working on to the boy. It looked like a pair of wristbands, but they were actually something quite different. Your original tails dropped off when we freed you the first time. Took a while, but I made these based on the way you fight. They'll also help to keep Arachi in check if need be, the smith said with a smile. Izuku hugged and thanked her for helping him to learn about what he was. Are you really sure about this? Do you really want to go this far? Joanne asked one last time. And when the two teens nodded, he sighed before wishing them both luck. Giving Leaky a hug before she teleported them all away. 
He looked up to the sky with some unease before saying, I wonder if this is some greater test, to see if we incarnates are really ready, to be more a part of this strange world. Tana put a hand on his shoulder and said they would have to wait and see for themselves. Izuku POV, kinda nice to be back home, though, Leaky Knee is a bit too nervous while we're heading back to our old apartment. Leaky Chan, it's okay. Even if you had your ears and tail out, most wouldn't bat an eye, my mom said while trying to reassure the girl. But she shook her head, pulled her hat down tighter and ducked behind my dad. It's so strange to see her like this. Back at the incarnate hideaway, she was usually happy and somewhat energetic. Though that could have been either compensating or projecting to keep her fears down. That or she was just much happier back at the hideaway. Licky, don't worry, I'm right here with you. We all are, and things are better here thanks to All Might, so we don't have the same things to worry about. I say to try and help her, taking her hand as we reach the floor for our apartment. Though it's pretty clear it will take her some time to get used to being around more average people again. Not like I blame her after what she's been through and how long she'd been avoiding most of the world. And maybe some of that could be done while I'm practicing for the entrance exam. And I've heard of one of the perfect places to do it. You sure this is a good idea? Lakey asks while I'm moving, breaking, melting etc. The various piles of trash dumped here by people. Or in the case of my earth head, it just eats or buries some of the piles into the ground. Lakey though has been teleporting some of the piles to junkyards around the world. How is it that you know right where any place is again? I asked one day. She smiled before explaining a bit more about her abilities. Happily talking about how she can picture any point in the world after seeing the locations or just knowing the longitude and latitude. It's really handy when you need to get out of a situation quick. Or just need to make someone disappear, she said with a smirk. I raised my eyebrow at that and decided to not ask what she was getting at. I rolled my shoulders before trying out a special combo of attacks. I punched my fists together and the wristbands turned into snake-like gauntlets, with the fire and water head settling into the gauntlet somehow, giving me the ability to punch and blast the elements out. Okay, that is cool. Do you have anything like this? Nah, didn't uh, didn't really need anything like that. I'm more about dodging or using the environment after all, Lakey said when we took to sparing. And I do see what she means. Every time I attack, she teleports away or makes a portal that redirects some of my attacks, even teleporting the objects around the piles of junk to drop on top of my head. But this does give me the chance to figure out a new skill when fighting. Normally I stick to just having one element for each arm. After dodging a few of her junk drops, I thought of a different way to use the extra heads. Namely, by focusing on two specific ones to act as defense, earth and wind. What it results in is that the earth head reaches up and intercepts the incoming junk while making a stone-like shield around me. Or the wind head creates a barrier around myself to blow back the attacks. Okay, that was creative. But you might want to be careful with it Izuku. Lakey says before gesturing around. And I see what she means. The wind blast ended up knocking some of the various things into other walls and knocking over piles of trash. The earth head though ends up causing some minor destruction beneath me. I'm going to have to figure out how to compensate for that. As I'm thinking this aloud, Lakey sneaks up on me from behind and tosses me to the ground. Before I can stand though, she's behind me again and tossing me up into the air and teleporting around while kicking and punching me while I'm disoriented, finishing with a strong stomp kick to my midsection. As I'm groaning from the small crater she put me in, Lakey smiles at me before dropping some wisdom. Just because your power is more destructive or relatively flashier doesn't mean you can't be beat. Sometimes the easiest way to win is to take your opponent off guard. Fair enough, though I have to wonder if that is what it will take for the entrance exam. Speaking of, have you talked with UA about transferring in? As I as this, I can see Lakey tense up and look away. So, I pushed her a bit more and she admits she hadn't. Guess she's still scared of quirks and those who use them. Even if she could pass off her transformed appearance or powers as a quirk. You can't keep running from this. Besides, even if it was somewhat secret, sooner or later the heroes will know that I'm back. And a few of them will recognize you. She's looking at me with an uncomfortable gaze. But I can tell this time she's seeing the merit of what I talked about. Which is why I guess we're heading to UA about a day or so after I brought it up. So why am I here? I ask with some confusion. Lakey looks at me with a gulp before saying, to help me keep my nerve. Let's go. And right as she says that, she grabs my arm and we teleport into the school. Right into the principal's office. Great. Not a place I'd want to go no matter the circumstances. Who in the? Oh dear. This is quite unusual, a rodent-like creature says. Oh wait, that's Nezu. The hero principal of UA. Forgot about that. Just as Lakey and I are getting acclimated a group of heroes burst in. Lead of which being a scraggly black-haired man with a scarf. Behind them are present Mike, Midnight, Vlad King, and Snipe. Guess they are all hero teachers here. Sir, we came as fast as we could, and we'll take care of this pair of kids. Midnight starts before noticing who it was that invaded the office, looking at us with some incredulity. At ease, Nimuri. I believe our young friends here have something to say. I was curious on the matter involving young Midoriya after all. Okay, guess he was considering all the options before I would try to enroll, let alone the mess that comes from any other students. He then gestures to the couches before brewing some tea to share with us. We take our seats as the water starts to boil. The scarf-wearing hero and Midnight stick around and stay close to Nezu. 
as he fills a few cups with tea and takes his own seat. Now then, what is it you'd like to talk about? Izuku sighed a bit before taking a sip of tea. Lakey though still had a nervous look as Nezu and the other heroes looked over the duo. So then, I know a bit of what happened a few months back young man. But I'd like to know more of what happened since then. Right. Well, it's a bit involved. So, strap in. Izuku says with a smirk. The teachers look at him with a bit of incredulity, given the flippant reply. Only for their faces to morph into shock at what he described and showed them. Even when the scarf-wearing hero eraser head or Aizawa Shota tried to cancel out the snake heads Izuku made appear. And while Nezu was terrified of the snakes, he didn't let it show and carefully put his cup down before addressing the students again. So what is it you two are hoping to do here today? He asked with a minor tremble. Izuku looked to Lakey to see if she wanted to speak first. But she was still scared, so he brought up his own intention to apply to UA. Aside from it being my dream since I was a child. I, I need to do this for a few others. Lakey least of all. Hearing that made the teachers even more curious about the girl. Izuku gave her a look to say that she should talk about what happened to her. She grumbled a bit before talking about what she'd been through before and after awakening as an incarnate. Midnight burst into tears before wrapping the girl in a hug, with Lakey a tad uncomfortable at the affection given her history. Aizawa and Nezu meanwhile griped their fists to tight they were either bleeding into their hands or had broken the cup they had been holding. It seems that Joe in person may be more of a hero than we gave him credit for, and quite the terrifying ability he has. Does he intend to make his presence known at all? Nezu questioned after calming himself down. Izuku shook his head to somewhat reassure the administrator, noting the man's wish to keep their conclave secret and safe. Aizawa sighed before piecing together some of what the two were there for. You'd like for Hapala-san to be admitted here, yes. Even though we already have a full second-year class and I assume she's behind compared to the rest, he said bluntly. Nezu though seems intrigued at the idea of having incarnates around and what their potential could be as heroes. Besides, there may be villains who are in fact incarnates but we can't identify them because we don't know enough. Am I correct in assuming so, young Midoriya? I'm not exactly the best person to ask about that. But from what Johan and the others said, that is fairly likely. Izuku said with a shrug. Nezu nodded while standing and moving over to his desk. He pulled out a few pieces of paper and began writing. All of the humans in the room started looking at him oddly as Nezu continued to write. There we go. I'll put it before the school board later, but I'd like the two of you to have these for now. Nezu said before the papers to Izuku and Lakey. Papers which stated that both of them were part of a new scholarship program that be starting this year. I don't have a proper name in mind, but I'd like to extend this to those with unusual circumstances such as yours. The incarnates looked at him a bit strangely but Izuku was excited for the experience and chance. Are you sure about this sir? Aizawa said with a little suspicion. While he was sympathetic to both students, he was less inclined to automatically trust them. Especially given Izuku's destructive potential and the fact he had only general control. But Nezu remained firm. We need to give them a chance. Miss Hapala especially deserves and needs to feel safe and that she could help others. So why not give them that chance? The rodent says with a sip from a new cup of tea. Aizawa sighs while Midnight hugs both of the young incarnates and drags them off to get their measurements for their uniforms. As well as introducing Lakey to Hound Dog, who was snarling and crying the girl's history. I know, I may not be the best face to see in some cases. But my door is open if you need it. And I think Recovery Girl would be happy to help as well. Lakey nodded nervously to the large man, unsettled not just because of the quirk element, but also because she was a squirrel and Hound Dog was a, well, dog. Though she was also a bit uncomfortable when she was getting measured. Oh my, such impressive breasts you have, Lakey Chan. A tight, thin waist and quite nice hips as well. You'll have the boys and girls keeping a close eye on you, Midnight said while taking the girl statistics in the nurse's office, only to be whacked and then sprayed with a water bottle by Recovery Girl. The old lady then shoved the raven-haired hero out of screen before checking over the scared incarnate girl again, including treating some of the area where she had been scarred. Though not before Izuku got an eyeful of Lakey's exposed breasts and body, giving him a massive nosebleed. While he was gripping his nose he groaned before saying, Okay, not helpful and please don't make any comments right now ma'am. Midnight pouted as she was getting ready to make a little comment about him using what he saw later, with Hound Dog chopping the top of her head. After this was done, Nezu asked that the two demonstrate some of what they can do. Even with the description of your abilities, I'm still a touch curious. Izuku shrugged and said it wouldn't hurt. Lakey sighed and agreed to show the teachers what they'd be working with. The duo were escorted to a battleground and a set of villain robots were released. So, we or I just have to take out the robots in the time limit. Izuku asks while rubbing his wrists and wristbands. And when Nezu confirms that being the case, he smirks and punches his fists together, creating the twin snake gauntlets. Before anyone can ask questions, Izuku takes off and starts fighting. First easily burning or blasting through the one and two point robots with fire and lightning punches. Then shifting to his earth and wind to take out the three point robots with ease. Well, technically we didn't tell him to go, but I guess we weren't planning to do that for the main exam as is. Nezu says slightly miffed. Recovery girl and present Mike have a little laugh at his expense before focusing on the drone's power loader launched. Aizawa meanwhile looked like he was having an aneurysm because of how much power Izuku was showing. 
and he knew that he couldn't stop the boy with his own quirk. He's going to be in my class, isn't he? The underground hero said with a twitch of his eye. The principal looks up at Aizawa and seems to be thinking the matter over a bit before shrugging. Izuku meanwhile had gotten through at least 20 robots before he started feeling even remotely tired. And even then, it was little more than needing to catch his breath. Whoa, what the heck? I thought this area was clear. Izuku suddenly heard while melting the head of a robot with his fire gauntlet. While also crushing a robot with his dark head, cutting one in half with the light head, and making one burst from the inside with his water head. He sprinted over toward the cries he heard and saw a couple of students attacking another group of robots, one of whom was naked. Okay that's weird. Duck down, Izuku said then shouted. With all of his snake heads out, he unleashed a massive elemental barrage and cleared the way. You know, we had that pretty well handled, a disgruntled pink-haired red-eyed girl said. She had an electric arrow in her hands before waving her hand and making it disappear. The others with her were a periwinkle-haired big-eyed girl, a pointy-eared boy who was facing the wall, and a naked teen from earlier who was struggling to put some pants on. So, who are you? Aren't you kind of young to be here? Hey, what's with those snake thingies? Do you have a quirk like Tamaki's? How did you do that beam thing or umph? The periwinkle girl started before the blonde boy covered her mouth. He smiled at Izuku and her before saying, Easy Hado. I get the feeling we may have walked in on something we maybe weren't supposed to be here for. While he was saying this, Nezu was demanding to know who led a few of the soon-to-be third years into the battlefield without his permission. Izuku clears his throat before saying he was part of a special program that had only recently been approved. They were testing my abilities and, okay that's overkill. Izuku started before his eyes widened and saw a huge robot coming their way. One that smashed part of a building and sent fragments at the group. The blonde lost his pants again as the rubble went through him while the pointy-eared boy and hyperactive girl named Hato started flying. Though this left the pink-haired girl in a bit of a dangerous spot, namely because she was struck by some of the debris while Izuku was protected by his snake heads. But he and the blonde were knocked back before they could try to save her. Izuku shook his head and saw the girl about to be crushed and only one thought ran through his head. Not again. He shouted before rushing forward as fast as he could with his incarnate abilities. And right as the fist came down, Izuku caught it with all of his Yamato no Orochi heads. The blonde boy shook his own head and realized what was going on, and phased into the ground to quickly get to the pink-haired girl. Get her out of here now. I'm finishing this, Izuku commanded with his eyes flashing. While a bit unnerved, the blonde agreed and got the girl out of there as fast as he could, only to be shocked when he saw Izuku replaced by a giant nine-headed snake that quickly ripped the giant robot apart. A notion carried by all of the people watching the battle unfold. Well except for one. Good. He may have freaked out a bit, but Izuku is still in control. Lakey he says with a smile toward the screen. Aizawa meanwhile had passed out because once again, he could not stop this power. And he'd likely be having to deal with it every day. Back in the battlefield though, the four older students assumed they'd have to fight this massive beast before them. As it loomed over all of them, Hato and the pointy-eared boy prepared to attack. While the blonde was looking to get away since his power might not be the most useful in this situation. You can calm down. I'm fine. Izuku says in a deep voice that reverberates through the area. Though the fact he could talk at all, and at least one of them recognized the form from a few months back, shocked them all. What the hell is going on? The pointy-eared boy asked in a panic. Izuku started shrinking down while one of the heads grabbed something. Like I said, they were testing my abilities. But that thing frankly was overkill. Izuku said before tossing the pants to the blonde. He was about to ask if Izuku needed some pants as well, but the boy's clothes were not damaged at all. Okay, how does that work? You turn into that giant freaking snake dragon thing and your clothes are fine. What kind of quirk do you have? The pointy-eared boy asked. The young incarnate just smirked before saying, it's not a quirk. I'm something most wouldn't believe is real. I'm an incarnate. The older teens look at him funny as he walks off to meet with the teachers. But they weren't going to leave it at that and started asking questions. Though not before introducing themselves. The blonde being Tagata Mirio, Hato's full name being Hato Nejire, pointy ears was Amajiki Tamaki, and the pink-haired girl was named Hei Yuyu. So what are incarnates exactly? Yu asked as they were approaching the entrance to the battleground. Izuku hums for a moment before saying, I can explain as we watch Lakey's test. Though I get the feeling we'll be going somewhere else. That is accurate Midoriya-sen. You might have gone a bit overboard though. Nezu says with a slightly annoyed look on his face. Izuku lets out a strained chuckle before apologizing. He sighed before asking Power Loader if there were more practice robots. He confirmed that there were. But we don't have any more of the zero-point robots. He ripped apart the test one they sent to us, the helmeted hero said while facebombing. Izuku just shrugged and said he started moving before he thought. They took the test to a different battleground and told Lakey that her challenge was the same as Izuku's. Okay, here I go, she said as her tail appeared from her behind and she gained her squirrel ears. With Nejire and Yu commenting that they wanted to hug her fluffy tail. But Lakey looked at her uncomfortably before teleporting away. Which surprised everyone again. So Midoriya san care to tell us what Apollo san is the incarnate of? Nezu said as the drone started showing Lakey teleporting around to fight. Be it grabbing a robot and dropping it atop another. 
or in some cases she teleported one into the path of another robot's attacks. She's the incarnate of Ratatoskr. Her nickname was Rata with the other incarnates. Izuku explained as Lakey kept leaping around. Mezu nods and acknowledges the fitting abilities. Ratatoskr was a god and caretaker of the world tree in myth. I guess in her case, that involves teleporting all around the world if she wants. The other teachers hum before questioning what Izuku was the incarnate of. Oh yeah, that's a little awkward, because I'm the incarnate of Yamada no Orochi, which is why I turn into that when I go all out. This makes the students and teachers sweat dropped or gulp at the possible danger that could come from Izuku alone. For Lakey though, she easily deals with all of the robots and passes with little difficulty. She stretches a bit after teleporting back to the main group and yawns. Not exactly much of a challenge with these things. Nothing compared to Tana's machines. Maybe for you, but I had my own challenges, Izuku says with a raised eyebrow. Power Loader though stops the girl and asks what she was talking about. Lakey looks to the side before explaining. Oh, uh, Tana is the incarnate of Hephaestus. She can make just about anything with a little time. From robots, to weapons, to spaceships. We used one to help a member of our group get to the moon. We got there and back in about two days. Though we stayed up there for a couple of days before returning home. We still have it back there now that I think about it. This makes Power Loader's eye twitch as most of the scientific community had foregone space travel of any kind in favor of studying quirks. And this strange group of people easily made a space-worthy ship that got them to the moon in a day or less and could be reused easily. Power Loader says while scratching at his head. Nezu thanked the two incarnates and said he have some other details for them later, before asking to speak with the four students that shouldn't be there, who all sweat dropped with slightly panicked looks. Lakey breathed a sigh of relief and grabbed Izuku's arm before teleporting away. Well that went well, Izuku said when they made it home. Lakey just gave him a look before thanking him for coming along, not just because I was scared, but also for explaining things to them. Maybe I'll get more comfortable eventually, she says with an uneasy look towards where Yue was. No POV. Izuku let out a breath while looking up at the gates of Yue once more. I made it Kakan. I'll try to be the heroes we both hope to be. Izuku thought while waiting for Lakey. But the girl was constantly looking around in a bit of fear. As well as keeping a hat on her head, despite her ears not being out. The younger incarnate sighed before saying, Lakey Ni, you are fine. No one is going to do anything to you. Now come on. We need to meet with Principal Nezu. He took her hand and walked with her into the school and waiting at Nezu's office. And the rodent-like hero smiled when they came in. I'm glad to see both of you. You a bit more Miss Hapala. I know you have misgivings, but I can assure you, we will not tolerate anyone attacking or harassing you about your features or history. Nezu walks up to her while saying this and gently pats her shivering hands. The Ratatoskr incarnate gulps but thanks the man. With Midnight coming in next to escort both students to their classrooms. Izuku was assigned to 1A, to Aizawa's chagrin. Lakey though was brought to 2A. Don't worry, I'll be watching over you. I'm the homeroom teacher here, Midnight says with a gentle hand on Lakey's shoulder, who grips her hat a bit tighter but nods to the woman. Back with Izuku, he was looking out over the grounds as some of the other students of Wana started to arrive. The first two being a bespectacled taller boy and a girl with a large onyx ponytail behind her. Oh, I thought I'd be one of the first here. Were you at the entrance exam? Or are you a recommended student? The boy said with a look to Izuku. The girl shook her head and noted that he wasn't at either of the recommended exams. Izuku smirked and chuckled a bit before saying, I'm something of a strange or special case. It's, well you'll find out later. While he was saying that though, he felt a ringing in his head, as well as his eyes being drawn or forced toward the girl. Knock it off Arachi. Now isn't the time for whatever this is, Izuku thinks to himself, apologizing when he notices the girl turn away from him. As more start to arrive, Izuku starts feeling a few new twinges in his head. You do this now. You never reacted to Lakey. One of the heads lets out a hissing laugh and says, that was because you were constantly trying to learn to use us. As well, she doesn't really appeal the same way to us. Izuku grits his teeth while slightly taking note of how each head was now responding. Fire seemed the most interested in the first girl, Yeirazu Momo. He could hear it snarling and licking its lips as he looked her over. Thunder meanwhile seemed intrigued by a girl that had strange extensions from her ears. Water meanwhile sounded like he was salivating while looking at a girl with long green hair and wide eyes. Everything okay, Ribbit? She asked before introducing herself as a Suitsuyu. Fine, just a little headache, Izuku said while rubbing his temples. But the pounding increased with a pink-cheeked girl with brown hair walking in. I'm both surprised and not on your interest there, Earth. Izuku thought. Darkness though started mumbling some nothings upon seeing a silver-haired girl who had an almost spooky aura about her. And Light seemed interested in the strangest one, that being a probable girl that was just a walking set of clothes. I'm gonna guess invisibility is your quirk, Izuku said while looking at the girl in question. Though her face couldn't be seen, she seemed radiant enough to match the light. Yep, yep, I'm Hagakure Toru. What's your name? Izuku introduced himself while also having a moment of thanking Poison and Wind for staying quiet. This was when a few others noted that the number of people in the class was off. And it was Izuku's super senses that told him who was going to explain things. I think the teacher just showed up. 
though he really should take a shower before coming to class. No one asked you, Midoriya, though you may have a point, Aizawa said while laying in his sleeping bag at the door to the class. Most of the students looked at him with some confusion before the man got out of his yellow cocoon. He rolled some kinks out of his neck before saying, it took all of you ten seconds to really quiet down. You aren't rational enough. While most of the students were wondering who he was and asking if he was in any place to talk, Izuku had a quiet laugh, mostly because rational didn't really apply to him. Aizawa then pushed a button on his podium and revealed the PE uniforms for the students. Now then, all of you get changed and meet on the Phi Z grounds. We're going to have a little assessment of your potential. The brown-haired girl who introduced herself as Yuraka Achako brought up the assembly or meeting with the consulars. Yeah, he's not listening. And that's not the important thing here, Izuku said with a minor wink to the girl. Her cheeks got even pinker as the students were forced to go along with their teacher's plan. Once at the grounds, Aizawa nodded and told the students they would be doing a quirk assessment test. And will be doing it based on the standard physical tests. Ida, come here. Yes, sir. The bespectacled boy Ida Tenya said before walking up to the circle. Aizawa hands him a special softball and tells him to throw it with everything he had. That includes using your quirk. The young man nodded before rolling up his pant legs and revealing the engines in his legs. Aha, I thought the name Ida was familiar. But leg-based instead of arms like his brother. Izuku thought as Tenya prepared. He tossed the ball into the air and torqued up his legs as high as he could to kick the ball a fair distance. Aizawa nodded before saying, this is your challenge. Use your quirks in each of the exercises to get the best score possible. This should be fun, Achako said with a pump of her arms. A few others mirrored her thoughts, and Aizawa was about to bring them down. However, Izuku decided to do it instead. Don't go assuming that your power can fix everything. A disaster or a villain will be far more dangerous than would probably be expecting. The insomniac teacher sighed before agreeing with Izuku. He's seen it more than once. Given, a friend of his was killed by a villain right in front of him. A chorus of gasps were let out at that as some looked to Izuku with sympathy. He gave them a sideways look before bringing up something a few had noted. Remember when you said the numbers didn't add up. That's because I'm part of a new program. For training those who don't have quirks. But are far stronger than most quirks could be. His classmates look at him with confusion as he steps up to the circle. You sure? Aizawa asked with a sideways look. Izuku let out a breath before nodding. He takes the softball in hand while tossing it slightly. Upon the third toss, a few of his snakes form around him. Eyes were wide seeing the creatures and a few even recognized them. Those look like that thing that attacked in downtown Mustafa. Momo exclaimed with her hand covering her mouth. But she then felt a shiver as one of the heads turned toward her and seemed to glare into her soul. Focus, let's do this, Izuku said as two of the serpents settled on his arms, transforming them as he tossed the ball high into the air. Right as it was coming to eye level, he thrust his arms forward to unleash a beam of elemental energy, which all of his other serpents followed along with. Ease up enough to where we don't vaporize the thing, he commanded while adjusting his output. While not a massive beam of destruction, he was still imposing and sent the softball flying for two kilometers. Jaws were on the ground after seeing this, and Izuku chose to address everyone again. I'm something most don't know exist. A being once thought of as a myth or similar. I'm an incarnate. One of Yamada no Urachi. The snakes disappeared as he was saying this before reminding them that they were aiming to be heroes. Me included. So you should never assume that a fight, a rescue, or anything will be easy. Aizawa sighed while slightly muttering that Izuku stole his whole intimidation moment. He then cleared his throat before saying, since you think this will be so easy, the three students at the bottom of the assessment will be expelled. And while some want to claim it wasn't fair, Izuku's statement earlier rang through to them and they focused on doing the best they could. Though the young incarnate kept surprising everyone with the ways he would use his abilities. Matching the speed of Ida during the 50-yard dash and admitting he was still somewhat slow. Or using his snakes to propel himself further during the long jump and then flying for a bit with his own powers. Most of the students want to ask what an incarnate is, but they are sidetracked by trying to keep themselves out of the danger zone. Unfortunately, that is easier for some compared to the rest. Namely a short boy whose quirk seemed to just be having sticky orbs on his head. Toro whose quirk just let her be invisible so she was only working with an average teenager's strength and speed. And the girl who had strange earlobes, as her quirk had less practical applications for the tests involved. And when it was all said and done, those three were stuck at the bottom of the list. The short boy was Minta Minoru and he was tearing up while pulling at his head and quirk. Toru wasn't much better. And the last girl was Jairo Kayoka, who was gripping her fists tight while trying not to cry. Izuku looked at them all with sympathy, but the girls were causing a new set of thoughts in his head. Namely that thunder and light were tempted to rip Aizawa a new set of holes. And Izuku had stirrings in his heart to let them do that. The pro hero nodded slowly and asked the three of them to come with him. Momo though had a shocked look on her face as they were walking off. I was certain that he was lying. Just trying to bring out the best in us. He still is. Just, not the way you might be thinking. Izuku says before saying they should head back to the classroom. A few wonder why he was being so blasé about the matter but weren't sure how to ask it. Given many of the bombs dropped about him and during their whole morning, 
It finally took the red-haired teen Kirishima Ijiro to talk to Izuku about certain matters. Okay, I'm not sure the best way to talk about this, so I'll just shoot straight. Are you that monster that appeared and killed that sludge villain? Izuku snorted a bit before letting out some bitter laughs. He shook his head before saying, got it in one guess. I suppose it was all over the news, especially All Might getting smacked around by me. Hiroshima gulped before asking how his incarnate powers worked and why he killed the villain. Aizawa mentioned that a friend of mine was killed by a villain remember. It happened that day, as well as hearing all of the, well a lot of other things piled up in my head. And Arachi took the moment to take control. Izuku took the time to explain he was one type of incarnate, a transform type. So, it's like a transform quirk. The bird-headed Takoyami Fayumi asked with a tilt of his head. Not exactly. Incarnates don't operate the same way you might expect. Transform type just transform into their daemon. Or the deity were tapped into. He illustrated by turning his arm into a snake again. The wind head formed from his hand while stretching out and grabbing onto objects. There are two other types, but you won't have to meet them. The two here are both transform types. Everyone in the class looks at him odd before thinking too. Though a new shock was had in mind to Toru and Jairo returning to the classroom. What? I thought you'd been expelled. Ida shouts upon seeing the trio. Jairo clears her throat before admitting they were. And then he re-enrolled us. Said that. He wanted us, all of us I guess, to experience death. Even if it was just metaphorical. While she had been talking, Izuku was scowling. Mostly because Thunder was making sounds while she was talking that made him rather uncomfortable. Knock it off. Seriously. Am I going to have to be dealing with this all the time? Izuku thought while trying to look away from Jairo. Only for Fire to chuckle and remind him of something. While we may have some influence, ultimately you are the one who is attracted to these girls. We're just a few little voices advising you to go after them. Izuku gurks before shaking his head and hoping Lakey's day was going better. And the answer to that was, mixed. Lakey looked around the two a classroom as the other members came in for the first day of the new year. Most of them looked to her with confusion and some suspicion, which made her put her hat on tighter. All right, everyone ready for your next year to be the next big heroes. Midnight asked as she walked into the classroom. While a few boys followed her hips as she walked, the snap of her whip made them focus. Lakey gulps again as Midnight starts talking. Now then, as you've noticed there is a new student with the class. Normally I'd have her introduce herself, but, well she's got some matters to deal with and I think many of you may not believe or really understand them. Nuwata Fuwa, a pink-haired girl with puff earrings, looks at both funny before speaking up herself. What do you mean? She asked with a sympathetic look toward Lakey. She shook her head while turning away from the pink-haired student. Midnight gave Lakey a complicated look before telling the students to focus. For now you have to focus on what you will do next to prove you can be heroes. And don't forget, all of you do have a bit of a black spot to work with. Quite a few of the students groan as they are reminded of the fact they all have an expelled mark on their records thanks to Aizawa. The only one who didn't funny enough was Lakey just because she was a new student. So, what's your name? And your quirk? Few asked after easing over to Lakey while she was distracted. And quite a few of the other students were wondering the same. Intimidating her with their gazes, even if unintentionally. Okay, how about we go somewhere else? Fua says this with a smile toward Lakey, before grabbing her hand and pulling her out of the classroom. Hey, what are you? Where are we going? Lakey finally stumbled out as the pink-haired girl kept pulling. Somewhere to talk, Fua said quickly while watching their backs. Pulling Lakey into a stairwell, she first made it seem like they were going up, only to surprise the incarnate girl by jumping over the stair rail then using her quirk to quickly make a puff zone to soften their landing. Why did you? S.H. As Fuel was quieting Lakey, a few other footsteps were heard and started going up the stairs. She smiled before directing Lakey to follow her again, this time less forcefully. Sorry about that, but I figured you wouldn't be comfortable talking with everyone around. Um, thank you. Lakey mumbled out while following her classmate to the library. They addressed the librarian and then headed to a quiet area above the main study sections. Fua then directed Lakey to a corner table and re-asked her questions. From the way Miss Midnight it, most of us wouldn't really understand what you've been through. I'm guessing it's more than about why you're wearing the hat. Were you someone from the rural areas with a mutant-type quirk? Lakey was wide-eyed and then brought her legs up to a fetal position. No, that's not all of it. In fact, I and my parents didn't have quirks, so we first got forced out of the city for being behind everyone else. The pink-haired hero was wide-eyed at that, but even more so when Lakey explained and showed what she was, making her tail and ears appear and talking about being an incarnate, and how those with quirks attacked her and her family just because she was somewhat animal-like. Fua had been a bit misty at first, but hearing what Lakey had endured and lost made the tears fall like a river. She wrapped Lakey in as tight of a hug as she could, even using her quirk to try and make it warmer and maybe more comforting. I'm sorry, I'm so, so, sorry, for everything, she said between her crying. Lakey was already crying but it eased for a moment to tell Fu it wasn't her fault, just the fault of the ones who attacked her. Besides, Joan got some revenge for me and my parents, and he didn't have to spill any blood. What do you mean? Fu asked with a sniffle, 
only to be wide-eyed upon hearing what the tear incarnate could do in subtle ways. After drying their eyes a bit, Fua decided to broach what kind of incarnate lake he was. Well, I'm the incarnate of Ratatoskr, and I can. Well, hold on. She grabbed Fua's arm and then teleported them both to the top of the building. And then for a bit of real fun, she warped the pair to Hawaii and a few other cities around the world. Whoa, that was incredible, Fua said after they returned to UA, playing with a toy double-decker bus she picked up while in London and adjusting her beret from Paris. Yehuda, has moments where it can be a lot of fun, Lakey says while smiling for one of the first few times today. They meet again with their classmates who ask where they went, and Fua gives Lakey a cheeky grin before saying, oh just around, getting to know each other a bit. Her classmates ask for details, but the pink-haired girl stays quiet on the matter, as part of a promise to Lakey to not talk about her past or powers until she was ready which the incarnate girl appreciated as the first day continued before they had to head home. So, seems like you made a friend. Izuku asked with a smile toward his pseudo-sister on the walk home, noting Fua and how she was tagging along. Lakey blushed and noted he was the opposite. Folks a bit more intimidated by you. Izuku cleared his throat before admitting it was slightly intentional. Let's just say, I'm a little uneasy with getting too close to people, given Arachi isn't entirely under control. Lakey shrugged and went with that. From the gate of the school though, a few people were looking at him and Lakey somewhat intently. Gyro being one, but the silver-haired telekinetic Yanagi Ryaiko was also watching him, intrigued by his ability and the other implications of it. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Deku fought Monster of Chaos. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Han Baron for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Deku Fanfic for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.